1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Let's stand and sing together. Rejoice, the Lord is King. <clears throat> Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our saints, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, our Lord and Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 6 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 6. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows, except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. We thank the Lord for his word this morning. As we continue in song, Come Thou Almighty King. <clears throat> Come Thou Almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious. For all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless, and give thy words 
success, Spirit of holiness, on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour. Thou who now rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, Spirit of power. To Thee, Great One in Three, yes, praises be, and evermore, Thy sovereign majesty, May we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Amen. By the way, be praying for Kareth. Uh, her back is spasming terribly this morning. That's why she's not with us. And she was to have been our special music. So children are dismissed to junior church at this time. And maybe pastor for once in his life will actually be done at quarter of. Might just happen. I wouldn't hold my breath or anything, but it might happen. First Corinthians 2. Paul has been talking about tongue and chink, wink, wink, man's wisdom, in quotes, and God's foolishness also in quotes. Uh, he's talking to the Corinthians. Corinth isn't all that far from Athens. Athens was supposedly the, basically the absolute center of the thinking world. Uh, this was where the philosophers were from. Uh, this is where we hear of Plato and Aristotle, Socrates and the like. Uh, everybody had their favorite philosopher, their fa favorite philosophical school and manner of thinking. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is how they thought. We're told of the Athenians that they love to spend their day in nothing more than the getting or giving of some new thing. Hey, have you heard the latest? That was how they thought. Now you come down the road, you're on the isthmus that separates the mainland of Greece from the Peloponnesus, that separates the Greece in the north with Athens from the Greece in the south with Sparta. And uh, here you have Corinth. We've talked about it before. It was a bustling metropolis. It was a crossroads town. Uh, people would travel. Uh, there's a canal there today that goes between the Aegean and the Adriatic Seas. And so if you want to make your way from Italy to Turkey or Turkey to Italy, the easiest way to do that is to go through the canal at Corinth. In their day, there wasn't a canal cut yet, but they would roll freight uh, by animal power and people power over the two miles of isthmus that separated those two large land masses because that was the easiest thing. Sometimes they'd actually roll whole ships up and over and uh, put them in on the other side. And so Corinth, if you were going to travel by land from the mainland down to the Peloponnesus, you had to go through Corinth. If you were traveling from the Aegean to the Adriatic with, with cargo especially, most likely you were going to go through Corinth. Uh, it was a very busy place. And so it was a major, major hub as far as shipping went. As far as foot traffic went, a lot of money was to be made there with people coming and going, but a lot of sin existed there as well. These were people that had their own way of thinking, and it was warped. We're going to find out as we keep going in our study that they were in a mess because they had the idea that it didn't matter if you did the right thing. It mattered that you knew the right thing. It was about what you knew and not what you did, which is counter to Scripture. Scripture tells us to whom much is given, much is required. It tells us to him that knows to do good and does it not. To him it's sin. And so that's the right way to think. Corinth, they had it all about what your thinking was. I remember our president at Bible college talking about dead orthodoxy. What he meant by that is this. We knew the truth. We knew all about the truth. But were we living in accord with the truth? Did our lifestyle agree with the truth of God's word that we were spending our life learning? i got to be honest, living in the dorms, that wasn't true for everybody. Not all of them were living according to what they were learning. 
And so he warned us about dead orthodoxy, and he was spot on. So after Paul, <coughs> excuse me, has kind of beat up man's quote-unquote wisdom and talked about God's foolishness that's wiser than men and his weakness that's stronger than men, uh, here he, he comes with the word yet. Uh, he, he's continuing and, and making a slight change here. He says, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. The King James uses the word perfect. When we think of perfect in our current usage of the English language, we tend to think of without flaw. We think of perfect as, boy, there's, there's nothing there that isn't absolutely, absolutely perfect and without flaw. Uh, but perfect in the original of the Old English meant complete, having everything it needed. Uh, so 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, instruction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. That word perfect there in the King James is mature and complete. So here, uh, Paul is not just talking about talking to old people. He's talking about spiritually mature people. Uh, by the way, you know there's a, there's a difference between chronological maturity and spiritual maturity. One of my dad's favorite lines is it's the difference between 50 years of experience and one year of experience repeated 50 times. Chew on that a little. You remember what God did? You know, I remember as a kid being shocked when I realized that you could walk from Egypt into Canaan land in a couple of days, even with a large group. It shouldn't have taken but a couple of weeks, and it took them 40 years. And I kept studying and realized, you know, what you all know by now, that the 40 years was wandering in the wilderness, taking another lap around Mount Sinai until they learned their lesson. Uh, they were doing the same thing over and over and over. If you keep getting the same results, if you keep coming against the same predicaments, if you keep hit, feeling the same hurts, if you keep stumbling in the same place, maybe there's a lesson that you need to learn so that you can move on to what's next. Take a long look at God's word. Find word that's appropriate to what you're going through and realize that sometimes when we feel like we do this again and again and again, you know, uh, it, it, and it's as simple as this sometimes, and sometimes it's a lot more complicated, but it hurts my head when I hit it against the brick wall. What's the doctor say? Please stop hitting your head against brick walls. Rocket science, isn't it? Uh, but sometimes we need to take a look and realize that sometimes we're in a cycle because of our own sin or we're in a cycle because of our own immaturity, by which I mean we haven't learned our lesson yet, we haven't changed our practice yet to match up with who God is and what he wants of us. Um, <clears throat> and so, generally speaking, you know, I, um, I'll just use one example, a silly one. When we were out in western New York in my first church, uh, we signed up for Dish Network. They sent me a young man right out of school. He looked around the house. The house, the church's house sat on two acres. There were about three trees on two acres. And he looked around. He says, I don't have line of sight. I can't do it. No, I, I can't mount it. You can't have dish. I'm sorry. So I called them and I says, could you please have somebody double check this? And they sent me a guy in his mid to later 40s with a little bit of gray in his beard. And he looked around and he's like, that kid must have had a date what he says I can take care of you and he did and then we moved here in our house on half an acre we've taken down 43 trees and we still have several dozen more there were a lot of trees at our house and where and again dish network sent me a young guy to put up my dish and he looked around my house and says I can't put it anywhere I don't have line of sight and so they sent me another guy this fellow was Eastern European I think he was a Russian fella again with a gray in his beard he looked around, it took him half the day to do it, but he got a dish on my house and it worked fine for years. Uh, sometimes, you know, age is preferable. I, I kind of like it uh, when I talk to people that, that have some years on them. You know, if I have an opportunity to hire somebody with some experience, I like to hire people that have experience. Sometimes I hire carpenters that are better than me. I like that a lot, it works well, uh, it's my preference. Uh, but the bottom line of it is, Usually with age comes maturity, but not always is it that way. 
Sometimes we have young people that outshine us because they have dedicated themselves to learning of the Lord and following Him. And sometimes we have older folks that are repeating that same year of experience over and over and over again. So he goes from denying earthly wisdom to describing God's wisdom. We've been told right along, we've made it a central focus as Paul has to this point, wisdom is not the, pre the prerequisite to salvation. And we need to think about that sometimes. Again, my job with the gospel is to put it in front of people as clearly as I can. What happens to it then has everything to do with, their, with them, with their heart, and with the Holy Spirit's working. I can't change a heart. Only the Holy Spirit can change a heart. The Word of God and the Spirit work together to change hearts. And so my job is to put the, Holy, put the Word there and to pray the Holy Spirit to take it and apply it to hearts. Let's have a word of prayer before we dig any farther. farther. Father, that you would open our hearts and free us of the distractions of the world and of the day. Uh, Lord, the hurts and the joys, the good and the bad, that we'd set them aside and that we would look earnestly at this very important passage, uh, that you would help us, Lord, to understand it, that you would help our lives to reflect it. Lord, both in our testimony as far as how we live and in our witness as we share Christ, uh, Lord, that we'd be better able to live for you and to make you known in a lost and dying world. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Divine wisdom. We do speak wisdom among those who are mature. Uh, even Jesus talked about casting pearls before swine. Now, I don't know how many pigs you have around here. I'm from Indiana. We grow corn, and corn grows pigs, and so they're everywhere. Let me tell you how a pig would see a pearl. A pig would see a pearl and say, mmm, sweet corn, and down it would go with the rest of the corn. That's how a pig would treat it. And the Lord said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Does this mean we don't share the gospel with people we don't deem worthy? No. But it means we don't continue to hit our head against the wall of continually putting it there when, they're re when it's rejected over and over and over again. I've had so many people where I've had an opportunity with them once and they've rejected me, but there was a day later where they listened to what I had to say. Uh, I, the one the most amazing was I was a teenager. I was back home in Indiana for the summer, and we were going door to door for a, a, a neighboring church that was just starting up in the next town over. And a lady literally slammed her door in our face, my buddy and I. And she was the first house, and we had to go around this large uh, development. And her house was where the bus was, the van was going to pick us up. And so we were sitting in the shade on a hot, hot, humid day. We were sitting in the shade of the only tree in her, in her front yard, which is a new development. And she saw us out there and she hollered to us and she had us come in. I thought she was gonna say, get off my lawn. She said, I'm sorry I treated you so terribly. Please come into my house for lemonade and cookies. By the way, that's what they mean by who's your hospitality. It's real. Uh, but um, we had an opportunity to talk to her about Christ because after seeing us out there sweating, taking the message door to door, uh, she softened up about it. Sometimes it's years and years later that somebody softens up about it. But we have to realize that there's a place to put God's word. We want to teach mature people who are able to take it to heart and live with it and put it to work. God's wisdom is hidden, verse 7. Uh, this, by the way, the, a wisdom, however, not of this age nor the rulers of this age were passing away. Amen to that, huh? I, I, I was saddened to see on the news even this weekend uh, that there's been a study done by the National Archive that the National Archive is racist. So the National Archive says that the National Archive is racist. And the reason for that is in, in all of the things, and the National Archive is where the, real con the original Constitution sits, the Declaration of Independence is on display there. Uh, that's what we're talking about. And it's racist because it has too shiny a view of the starting of America. Praise the Lord for America. Praise the Lord for people who wanted religious freedom. I, I say again, read a book. Dig into the wonderful history of our land, I, I, and you'll have something to stand on. But if the currents of this age are what you're trusting for truth, you're in big trouble because the currents are pretty warped right now. You've got to get into the Word of God, and you've got to know something about where we came from in all respects. 
Uh, this is not of our world or the rulers of the world. They're, they're passing away. Verse 7, but we speak God's wisdom in a mis mystery, uh, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The word is musterion. It's, it's shutting the mouth. It has the idea of something I'm not going to tell. You know, somebody has a secret and they're not going to tell. Uh, a number of the young ladies in our church have befriended my daughter. And some of them have given her little secrets like the gender of a baby or a baby name. And her mother and I have tried with torture and pry bar and bribe to get the baby names. And little sister won't talk. She keeps the mystery. She keeps her mouth shut. So Mysterion is keeping the mouth shut, keeping the secret, keeping the mystery. This was a mystery that was kept all through the Old Testament age. There's little hints to it. We can see it with our 2020 hindsight and, and, and looking rearward. We can see Genesis 3.15. We can see 2 Samuel 7 and God's covenant with David. We can see Genesis 15, his covenant with Moses, or with, yeah, with Moses, with Abraham. Uh, we can see little hints in the Psalms and in the prophets at the coming of Jesus and that he was coming to die. But looking forward, none of the prophets got that out of it. They were all shocked when Jesus was crucified. That wasn't their picture of Messiah at all. The mystery has been kept. God's true wisdom, once silent, is now revealed to believers. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25. Jesus is praying, verse 25, At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. The point is, we don't have to be Harvard, Yale, or Stanford graduates to grasp the truth of God's word, to grasp the truth of the gospel, to grasp the meaning of the mystery of God's plan for the ages. He's given it to us as unto babes, as unto little kids. It's that simple. I, I love the story of the great theologian who on his deathbed, somebody asked him what was the most important thing he'd ever learned in his life. With all the, the accolades, with all of the degrees after his name, with all the books written, and his deathbed answer was this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, end quote. It can get remarkably simple if we look at what God is truly doing in our lives. And he had this mystery that wasn't revealed until the time was right. God's wisdom is still hidden to the lost. If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so there are things that are kept in a mystery, and there are things that the devil wants to keep a mystery, to blind the hearts and the eyes, uh, and only the Spirit can open their eyes. We talk about the working of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the working of the Holy Spirit is profound in the life of the believer. In Acts chapter 16, the Bible says of Lydia that God opened her heart to believe. We talk about the call of God to salvation and, and whether there is such a thing as the called or election. The Bible teaches it throughout. Ephesians 1, 1 Peter 1, Romans 8, Romans 9, how that it's predestined and that he chooses us. That has to be because, dear friend, apart from Christ, I am a corpse on the floor, spiritually. Dead men cannot resuscitate themselves. Something that I found very interesting in the last, I don't know, 20 years, 25 years or so, is that they put these small uh, defibrillator-type devices in public buildings, in public schools, in, 
in courthouses and things like that, you know, in case of fire, break glass, has been in case of heart attack, break glass, pull this thing out, and you can zap, if you know what you're doing, you can zap somebody, zap their heart back to function, and therefore zap them back to life. But you know what you can't do? You can't zap yourself back, because you're dead. Dead people don't move. I know that's profound, but dead people don't move. They just don't. And so God works in me. By the way, a word about the songs that we're singing this morning. They're songs about the Holy Spirit. I, I gotta be honest with you, our hymn book doesn't have enough in it about the Holy Spirit. And virtually everything in the hymn book about the Holy Spirit needs a little explanation here and there. If you're here today and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I can say without doubt, the Holy Spirit is in you. He doesn't go anywhere and come back. He is in you. The Holy Spirit indwells us at the moment we trust Christ. Whether we sense it or not, whether we feel it or not, whether we knew about it when it happened. I was seven when I got saved. I, I was probably in my late teens, early 20s when I found out the Holy Spirit came into me and really got taught about what that really meant. But it was true the whole time, whether I knew it or not. And he was busy in there the whole time, whether I was aware of it or not. He's there. Uh, but so when we pray for the Holy Spirit to come, as we did in the previous song and will in the last song, understand what we're talking about is for his ministry to be real in our lives. He's there. He doesn't come and go. And uh, if you want to talk about that further, well, you're going to have to start coming on Thursday nights because in a couple months we're going to be on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and we'll really get into it. Uh, but uh, I'd love to talk to you about it. But if you're a believer, he's in there. So we're not praying him to come in a secondary way. He's already there, and we're glad for it. God's wisdom is still hidden to the lost. God's wisdom was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Verse 7, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Let me make Mr. Fish happy. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. For our purpose this morning, we're going to hit and run and we're going to pick a verse. Let me encourage you to spend time in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. You want to learn about your salvation, what God has done in your life, what that means, how that came to be, Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2. And when you've read it through, read it through again. Uh, one time that you read it, have a pen and paper ready and write down how many times a proper name for God, God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit is used. Write down again how many pronouns that refer to God, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit are used. And you're going to see that, especially in chapter 1, references to God, references to all three people, three persons of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are all the way through that. It is drenched in them. And personal pronouns. My salvation was planned by God the Father. It was purchased by God the Son. And it was made real to me by God the Holy Spirit who opened my heart to the whole thing. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. God chose me to salvation before Adam and Eve sinned. Think that one through a little bit when you got some time to really head scratch. He chose those of us who have trusted Christ. He chose us in him before the world began, before the foundation of the world, therefore even before Adam and Eve sinned. He was ready for it. He had chosen us long before. To our glory, that's an eschatological cer certainty. Now, forgive me a word like that. Uh, part of it is I got to make things fit in that little handout you've got. Eschatology is the doctrine or the study of the last things. So predominantly that's Daniel and the book of Revelation in our Bible, but there are plenty of other references. That's what eschatology is. And eschatological certainty means in the end of time, it will happen. We will be glorified. Amen? How wonderful that'll be. I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of fighting me. I've used the illustration before. I don't know if I've done it on a Sunday morning or recently, but one of my deacons in my last church was an older fella. He was widowed. We had his wife's funeral a couple years later. Uh, another one of the deacons and his wife had introduced him to a lady friend of theirs and he was going to get married again. He's getting married on Saturday and on the Wednesday night before he raised his hand for prayer request time. And you know what his request was? 
His request was that the rapture would happen that night. And every lady in the room said, oh, don't let her hear that, you know. But I had counseled with him. We had talked many times. He helped me in different ministries of the church, and we would travel in the car together, and we would talk, and I knew his heart. What he was saying is this, I am so tired of fighting my sinful self. Once you figure out what sin is, you realize you're dripping in the stuff, and it's a fight to put it down. And this man was saying what all of us feel. It's a fight, and it's a tiresome fight to continually have to fight against self to make things right and keep them right. But one day, we're going to be like our Lord. We're going to be glorified in heaven. It's an eschatological certainty. Um, it's not understood by the rulers of this age. If they understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, verse 8. Think about that. Peter talks about it a little bit in his sermon in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Uh, he, he says, you, you took the Lord and you, by the determined counsel of God, you turned him over to sinful hands by which he was crucified and slain. He, he points the figure at the, at the leaders of Israel and says, you, you took the Lord and you handed him over. You bear the guilt. But dear friend, if people truly realized in the moment who Jesus was, he never would have been crucified for us. If he was never crucified for us, he would have never risen in victory and we wouldn't have the promise of resurrection by faith in him. If he was never crucified, my sin would never have been paid for and I'd still be soaked in it and I'd still be culpable, blamable for it in God's final court. But Jesus did die and Jesus was raised. A whole lot of the book of Galatians is Paul celebrating that very fact. Praise the Lord, I will glory in the cross, he says. I will glory, I will praise God, I will celebrate the cross. That horrible, wretched thing that it was. I celebrate it because but for the cross, I'm condemned for eternity. Because of the cross, I glory. And so... If they understood it, they never would have crucified him. I think that has a lot to do with the use of parables. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is telling parables and the disciples weren't getting them. And he says, you don't understand this parable, the sower. How are you going to understand the rest of them? He says, and he's in a ship, in a boat, talking to them. And he says, unto you it is given to know the mysteries, but all, and to those on the outside, outside, these things are given in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. It wasn't time yet for them to believe. Because if they believed first, Jesus wouldn't have been crucified. It had to happen. It wasn't understood by the rulers of this age. If they understood it, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9, quoting from Isaiah, but just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Uh, there's a, frankly, there's at least one sermon in just this verse alone. It, it's a place to stop and to ponder. It really is. Things that you haven't seen with your own eye, you haven't heard from somebody else, you never even dreamed up inside yourself, God has in store for those who love him. Isn't that an amazing thing? He has a mystery, he's had a mystery, and he's begun to reveal it, but he hasn't revealed all of it. If I asked you, just like kids downstairs, draw me a picture of heaven, how would you draw it? What would you know to draw? Usually people draw mansions, really big, beautiful houses. The word literally means dwelling places, Mansion is just one of several possible uh, words to bring that into English. And there's nothing that hints that it's a large and grand mansion. It's a dwelling place. It's a living place. How do we know how wonderful and grand heaven is? Well, pavement is gold. Gold that's so clear you can see down into it. It's that kind of gold. And the gates are made out of pearl. So that's pretty astounding. And so we, we extrapolate from there, don't we? If, if gold is pavement, yeah, pavement's relatively cheap in our world. We don't think much of it. You know, when they grind a highway up, they, they just 
basically sell it to somebody else to make a driveway out of, we know. Uh, they don't take it home and sell it. Otherwise, the Dochmo boys have big and heavy pockets, wouldn't they? You know, let's sneak this home and sell it. It's just pavement. It's not diamonds. It's pavement. But in heaven, gold, which we cherish dearly, is pavement. And so we extrapolate from there. But frankly, about the building, about the structure, about what heaven looks like, dear friend, we don't know much at all. We're given just a smattering, just a taste, just enough to know, oh, it must be amazing. It's like there's an hors d'oeuvre on the outside of a really good restaurant, and you're given a free hors d'oeuvre, and it's just enough to, make, to let you know, wow, everything must be incredible in there, because this is what's given away for free. We have just this little picture of what heaven is like. We can't even picture it. We'd never dream it up. It's beyond our imagination, and that's saying something. <clears throat> We find in this passage the distinct truth that it takes one to know one. Maybe a little more precisely, like is known only by like. Um, there's, you know, in, in whatever your, your skill is, uh, whether it's your vocation or your avocation, whatever you're good at, you know, like um, Liberace, uh, of all people, for the preacher to quote, Liberace said, I can practice piano one hour a day and the average person will think I'm the best piano player they've ever heard. I can practice the piano three hours a day and accomplished piano players will think I'm the best piano player they've ever heard. But to play my best requires five to six hours every day. You see, there were people who could judge. Me, you know, I hear somebody play the piano and heh, I quit after three months of lessons. I, don't, I couldn't even play You Mary Had a Little Lamb. And so I'm impressed when somebody can play it. And when Debbie sits down and she plays all four parts of a hymn at the same time with two hands, man, I just, that blows my mind. I don't know how they do it. Uh, and, and then, you know, when people get at it and um, can play an arrangement, I'm just, I'm in awe of that. But someone in their peer group would have something to measure by. Uh, for us, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like is known by like. We, we understand what we understand. It, it does take one to know one. And so in positive and negative ways, we see ourselves in other people and we understand them in the places where we overlap with them. Uh, here, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Um, the Spirit searches, he literally examines all things, even the deep things of God. Uh, but nobody knows God but the Spirit of God in the same way that nobody knows what you're thinking. Our wives are pretty good guessers sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, and, and parents, you know, have a pretty good idea what's going on, and there's a certain predictability to certain things. You know, you put those big gooey chocolate chip cookies you just took out of the oven in front of your little boy and you tell him, Johnny, you can't have one of those until after supper. Now I'm going to the market for milk. You can see the look in Johnny's face. He really wants that nice gooey chocolate chip cookie because it's human nature. We can see a little, but dear friend, we don't know what's in somebody's heart, do we? People can fool us. They can flim flam us. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you have to trust people to live in this world, but it can get taken advantage of pretty easily, and we've lived long enough, most of us, to know that and to know it well. The Spirit is the teacher. In John 16, 13, Jesus tells the disciples, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will bring to your remembrance the things that I have taught you. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. Night and day for three years, the disciples were with Jesus. They heard him preach, they heard him teach, and they heard him do both of those over and over and over again. They saw him heal people, and you would think it would kind of run together after a while. But the Holy Spirit came upon them, and the Holy Spirit guided them into the truth. He helped them to remember what Jesus taught them and to remember it well enough to write it accurately in his word. We've been studying that on our prayer meeting night. Inerrancy, uh, inerrancy is the Bible is free from error in the originals. In the original Greek and Hebrew, it is free from error, period, dot. Uh, and that is assured by the Holy Spirit superintendence. And so Matthew was a tax collector. He talks about money more than any of the other gospel writers. Luke was a doctor. 
He talks about physical things more than any other writer. Uh, Peter and John used fishing references. Matthew did not. Those sorts of things. They wrote based on who they were. Uh, but God used that because the Holy Spirit superintended it. The Holy Spirit teaches. The Holy Spirit searches the thoughts of God himself. Uh, <clears throat> that word deep can be literally deep, like deep water. It could be like Romans 11:33, figuratively, the depth of God's attributes and gifts. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, who, or who became his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? I, I give you, um, I kept going on that verse there with 34 and 35. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who knows what God's thinking? Anybody? Nobody. Not at all. Who's his counselor? Is there somebody that God goes to for advice? <laughs> There'd be no one. No one could begin to be God's counselor. Um, I praise the Lord for mentors. I praise the Lord for pastors that I can call up and I can ask questions. Uh, I praise the Lord for theologians that I can call up and I can ask questions. Oh, what a blessing that is. It was nice to have a couple of them here in person uh, on Sunday last week, my dad and my father-in-law. But there's a long list after those two men of, of men that have made themselves available to me. And God bless them for it. I'd be lost without them, especially as a young pastor. Man, I had these guys on speed dial. Uh, what a blessing. But God has no such counselor. God doesn't have or need a mentor. Nobody could possibly measure up to that. Or who has lent God something and waited to have it paid back? That's really what the end of that verse is talking about. Who has first given to him, God, that it might be paid back to him, the lender, again? I mean, we've lent ourselves money. We have people that owe us this, that, and the other thing. But anybody ever lend something to God that God's beholding to somebody? God isn't beholden to anybody. God is God. He's above all and everyone else. And so like is known only by like here in verse 11 is the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. He knows the inner workings of God's mind. He knows the feelings of God's heart in the same way that my inner self of self is the only person, the only thing that knows what I'm thinking or how I'm feeling or what's really going on between my ears, if anything at all. Um, he's trying to give it to us in a way that we can understand it. The Holy Spirit understands God's thinking in the same way that my immaterial part, that voice inside my head, my real self, is all that is, knows my thoughts like nobody else does on the outside. That I think is, I think the best that it can be explained to us. Only the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. Verse 12, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we can understand. And what he's going to come to and, and, and spell right out is without the Holy Spirit, we're not going to get it. We need the Holy Spirit. We've talked about it before, uh, even recently, when we're talking about wisdom and foolishness in the previous chapter. Sometimes we share spiritual things with people, and they glass right over. It's like an invisible force field went up in front of their face, and it's like it all just travels right over their head, like it's inside a wind tunnel and it's being redirected. Uh, but sometimes, oft times, that's merely the fact that they don't have the author of Scripture, the Holy Spirit, inside of them. When we have the author, oh, what a wonderful, beautiful thing that is. A couple times in my life, I've had a class or a seminar where the person who wrote the book that's being discussed is the person leading the class or the seminar. What a treat. You can ask a question. You can get a clarification. You can come to understand something and you don't have to guess at what they meant. You can ask them. What a wonderful treat that is. And dear friend, each and every one of us as a believer with the Spirit in our heart and the Bible in our hand has that exact dynamic going on. The Spirit helps us understand the Word. The Spirit helps us apply the Word. The Spirit takes the Word and makes a change in our heart because nobody else could do that for us from the outside in. And so we don't have the world spirit, but the spirit who is from God. By the way, notice the who? That's a personal pronoun. This idea that the spirit is a part of God or an idea or some ethereal object or, or something that we can sense, 
The Spirit is a person. He's a who. He's not a what. We may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. He says we speak these things from the Spirit, not in human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Um, this is a difficult passage. This is a difficult uh, pair of words here. And uh, I give you the marginal reading for the New American Standard. The NIV is somewhat similar in how they take it, and there are several other choices. Uh, the word is syn synchronantes or syncrino, to join fitly or to combine. Uh, to synchronize is a word that comes out of that. It's not the same, but it comes from it. And so the meshing of gears together that are synchronized to do their job, um, to put them together so that they make, w make sense that way. Uh, and then pneumaticoi is spiritual. I, I, typically, it, it speaks of spiritual things in general, but it also speaks of spiritual people. That's important when we get to chapter 3. Because Paul says, I, I couldn't speak to you as unto grown-ups, as unto spiritually mature. I'm still, I'm still speaking to you like babies. I'm still using my goo goo gaga voice for you. Uh, I'm still using my little bitty words, and I'm saying things with a little sing-song to it, you know. Um, my, my mom was an elementary school teacher, and she never lost that voice. And my family, until we lost her, my family picked on her. A bunch of my cousins were with us. We're in a big old station wagon traveling down the highway. Uh, most of us, half of us anyway, are in our teens, and the others aren't far behind. And it's fall, and we're traveling, and somebody had taken pumpkins and painted faces on them and put them on scarecrows and sat them around a table. And my mom says, oh, look, see the pumpkin people, children. And it was her little kid voice. It was her, you know, I'm teaching first grade voice. It wasn't her, I'm dealing with a bunch of, you know, teenagers who are related to me who are never going to let me forget it. But that's what happened. Uh, but Paul says I, in chapter 3, he says, I'm trying to talk to you as spiritual grown-ups, and I can't. Uh, you still, I have to give you milk. You're not ready for solid food yet. doesn't take kids re long to get ready for solid food, does it? They want food. They want to eat. There comes a time where milk isn't going to cut it anymore. You've got to start mushing stuff for them because they're hungry. Uh, you've got to take care of them, and that needs to be us, and we ought to grow, and our palate ought to grow with it, shouldn't it? As our appetite and our palate grow, we need to desire meat, uh, something that we can truly grow on. That's what the, how the Bible pictures that for us. Um, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words or interpreting spiritual things for spiritual men. I'll be honest, I like the marginal reading better, the New American Standards margin and the NIV margin. The idea of interpreting spiritual things for spiritual men, taking the spiritual truth and putting it together for spiritual men. Um, Pastor Branham and I had great plans for our overlap. We were going to take an afternoon or two a week that I was going to go to OCAM and I was going to sit down and, and he was going to share his heart and get me up to date on people and, and how things he did things here and what he believed about this or that. And we had all these wonderful plans and God had different plans and pastor got sick and we didn't get much time together. And uh, exactly a month after I slept my first night in our house and where the Lord took pastor home to heaven. And so there are certain things that I've learned. Most of what I've learned about pastor, I've learned from you all. That's the way this goes. Certain things, when you come into a man's office, you learn some things. And I liked it when I was going through the desk and I found his stationery. And the letterhead said, Pilgrim Baptist Church, preaching the Bible as it is to people as they are. I like the quote. Preaching the Bible as it is to people as they are. The Bible, you know, is what it is. It's God's perfect truth. And we need to give the plain sense of it. If that hurts somebody, if that offends somebody, we're sorry, but it's God's truth, and we can never apologize for God's truth. It's part of why I love expository preaching, because when I preach a hard passage, Corinthians has a couple, when I preach a hard passage, it's because I'm already done with the passage before it, and I'm not ready for the one that comes after it yet. It's not because I'm picking on somebody that this applies to. 
Uh, it's just you're there, and so that's a good pattern for preaching, I think. Uh, and then the Bible doesn't say that people have to become spiritually mature before they get saved, does it? Matter of fact, it tells us here we can't see spiritual maturity unless we are saved, unless we are the pneumaticoi. We are the spiritual people. We are people of the Spirit is what that word literally means. And so Paul is aiming this to the pneumaticoi, and he's going to challenge them to stop being sarcikos, uh, sarcophagus. That's an old dead body. That comes from that word. Uh, sarkikos. In other words, he says you are to be spirit people, people of the Holy Spirit, not flesh people. Uh, the word there that, that's carn, chili con carn, you know, with meat, or the carnival is pleasing the flesh. He says you're, you're, he either uses sarkikos or, or, or the one uh, flavor or another of carn, uh, carne, but he says you're of the flesh and you need to be of the spirit. And he's begging and he's pleading with them to think at a depth. He's begging and he's pleading at them to see things God's way and to live an obedient life before God. And so he challenges them throughout. Unsaved people are not the recipients of this revelation. Um, I didn't get it here on the screen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised the natural man doesn't get it he's not gonna get it he can't get it aside from the work of the holy spirit to bring him to salvation he's not going to understand it elder rule has become quite a thing even in our type of churches uh, a lot of churches have have gone from congregational government to elder rule i think they've done it for the same reason it was done in the late middle ages in the late middle ages they started practicing what was technically called the hospital church. What that meant was that you didn't have to be saved to be a member. Now, you don't have to be a saved person to come in the door, amen? We'd love to have the unsaved come in here. That's fantastic. But to join the membership, to be a voting member of a local New Testament church, we have to do our best diligence to be sure that somebody has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior because congregational government is about the Holy Spirit of God showing the will of God through the people of God. And if the people who are voting don't know the Lord, you've got a mess. And so in the late Middle Ages, when, they, when come one, come all turned into join one, join all, they realized they couldn't trust the congregation at large to make wise decisions, and so they put some of the older fellows to running the church. Today, elder rule is very similar, and one of the reasons it's popular is because campus churches where they spread out and one church may have eight locations, it's hard to have congregational government when your church is divided and there's 12.5% of it in each location. Uh, that's pretty hard to get together, and so they just have elders who get together and make the decisions. Uh, but we understand and we believe in congregational government, and congregational government has everything to do with the Spirit of God being inside the person who votes. And by the way, most of you don't show up to vote, and you ought to really think about it. We've got a business meeting coming up in a couple weeks. It's a little early this year because of VBS and camp. I think it's July 15th is our quarterly. Come and participate. Come and see how the church functions. Come and, and, and you know, uh, practice your membership. We'd like to have you here. But the unsaved don't get it. They can't get it because these things are spiritually determined, spiritually understood. And so here's his assertion. The man without the Spirit, the natural man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. He doesn't accept them because they're foolish to him. He doesn't understand the language. Sometimes we fall into trap. I know I did as a young man, as a teenage kid. I'd hear somebody in another language, and I would presume them to be ignorant because they weren't speaking in a way that I understood. Now I realize you talk to some European people, they might know eight languages. And me, I'm just a dumb American who barely takes care of his English. Uh, so my, my view has changed quite a little bit there. But it sounds like gibberish only because I don't know it. The natural man, spiritual things are gibberish to the natural man because he doesn't have the spirit within him. He doesn't have, if you will, the, the decoder ring of the Holy Spirit within him to come to grips and to understand these truths. Neither can he understand them. He, he doesn't accept them 
They're foolish to him. He cannot understand them. Why? Because they are spiritually appraised. They are spiritually discerned. Uh, to, to sort a thing out requires the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, I mentioned some of my uh, mentors to you. And again, there's men where I can, I can call them, and it might not be something that they've been through the exact trouble before, but they have enough of a background that they can discern something. They can ascertain something. Uh, if we don't have the Spirit, we cannot determine or ascertain spiritual things. And so, what do we do with this? Well, one, in your witness, pray. Never, ever lose sight of the power of prayer. As you are looking for change in individuals, parents, you're praying that your children will change their behavior and do the right thing. Pray that your children will change their behavior and do the right thing. Don't just worry about it. Don't just think about it. Pray to the God of heaven about it because the God of heaven can affect change. The Spirit changes lives. You're trying to lead somebody to Christ and you haven't gotten there yet. Maybe you feel like you're, you're seeing progress or you think you've got progress and then, you know, it all falls down. Pray. Don't ever, ever, ever lose sight of prayer. And realize your unsaved friends, your unsaved peers aren't going to get it. They're not going to understand you because they're from a different world. You have the spirit within you and they do not. You can determine spiritual things. You, you can have discernment in spiritual matters. They're not equipped to have discernment in spiritual matters because they don't have the spirit within them. And so, again, pray to, to their salvation. Pray to the God of heaven for their salvation. And take heart. Uh, we need to be growing. Uh, he's going to, you know, Paul has been talking about the world and its foolishness. And uh, my picture of that is, is those reciprocating anti-aircraft cannon, you know, on a, on a World War II era ship. Bang, 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 bang. I mean, they're thunderous guns. And they're pointed at somebody else. But next week, the turret's going to lower, and it's going to spin, and you're going to find yourself looking down the barrel. Because he's going to say to them, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. And so we need to ascertain, exercise discernment in regard to ourselves. Are we living for the Lord? Are we growing in the Lord? Is our behavior matching our confession? Are we students of the word? Have we grown at all? Are we on to our second, third, fifth, tenth year of experience? Or are we just on wash, wash rinse, repeat? And repeat in that same year of experience again. Uh, may we be growing in him. Father, thank you for your word. Please, Father, that you would use your spirit to impress it upon our hearts. Help us, Lord, to come to grips with it, to grow by it, that, Lord, we would be coming spiritually mature people, no longer tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of the teachings that come our way, but that we would be grounded in you and we're fully equipped because we have your spirit within and thank you that we have your word in our hands. Uh, guide us with it in Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is one we don't sing an awful lot but it fits so very well. Uh, so whether you sing it or not, think well on, and long on the words as we stand together and sing, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. <clears throat>
to love thee as thine angels love. One holy passion filling all my frame, the baptism of love and descended dove, my heart and altar and thy love, the flame. Hector, would you close in prayer, brother? As we close, worthy is the Lamb.